Okay, uh, thank you, Craig, for uh, inviting me. Uh, I couldn't come uh, last year because we were in the middle of having a baby, so I decided to come uh, this year. So Craig asked me to talk about uh, mechanization in California wine grape vineyards, but you know, uh, California is a big state. We have uh, different commodities that some of these uh, practices will more than likely apply. So why do this now? So we have some driving factors for mechanization, but not just for mechanization, but uh, precision uh, management in our vineyards. First of all, uh, timeliness of our cultural practices. You can uh, get through our vineyards in a lot of uh, places in a decent amount of time. Uh, we're also now uh, lacking a willing labor force. As you know, our cost of labor is uh, supposed to increase up to 15 hours, but it's already uh, above that in uh, most places. There are also a uh, quality of life and uh, socioeconomic uh, factors where you know, people just don't want to work in uh, vineyards anymore, or their kids uh, do not want to work in vineyards anymore. And as you know, our uh, industry is a rural industry, so we're not in close proximity to population uh, centers, so it's difficult to attract people to come uh, work in our uh, vineyards, do all these uh, cultural practices. Also, we have uh, land availability and our uh, cost. Uh, since moving to uh, Tokolana from a uh, Fresno region, I know how much our land costs now. And of course, we have our uh, foreign competition. Foreign competition, is not necessarily by design, but it's an uh, economic uh, necessity to uh, make the uh, uh, ends meet uh, these days. And uh, there's also uh, factors that are driving uh, precision management. We have variability in uh, vineyards that we cannot uh, account for, but we can act upon them. We also have a uh, greater planting density in our uh, vineyards. So 10 years ago, most of our uh, vineyards uh, were seven by uh, 11, but now uh, we're seeing more and more uh, vineyards going down to a uh, seven foot uh, row spacing, seven by five. So we're seeing a lot of uh, greater uh, planting density. So these need to be uh, managed a lot closely. When you have uh, more planting density, more plant population, uh, labor costs uh, essentially go up. And this is uh, you know, requiring a greater level of uh, mechanization, but also greater level of uh, monitoring by the uh, grower. But hopefully uh, you know, with mechanization, you have a greater level of uh, control. So what do I mean by uh, foreign competition? So University of California is a great institution. We have many campuses that you might not know about. We have a campus in uh, the country of Chile, which we uh, go on a lecture. And uh, this is the uh, slide that they uh, showed me at one of the uh, uh, estates in uh, Chile. So right now, uh, their uh, entry price is roughly about uh, $22 per case. Uh, free on board uh, before it leaves uh, Chile. And uh, at our uh, retail, they're uh, finding a uh, shelf space at uh, $7 a bottle. But keep in mind this uh, $7 a bottle would be uh, equal to about a $11 uh, price point with our uh, production costs. Their uh, reserve line, it's about uh, $35 a case. It's, uh, 11, it's finding a uh, shelf space in the uh, US at roughly about uh, $11 a bottle. But Based on our uh, uh, pricing scheme, this would be uh, you know, close to uh, $20, which would be about a premium. What they're uh, developing uh, now is uh, trying to look at uh, box pruning, roughly about uh, 35 uh, tons to the uh, hectare, which is what their potential would be, roughly about uh, you know, 15 to uh, 14 tons to the uh, acre. And uh, with uh, Reserva, they're also going into this uh, system, 16 to uh, 20 tons to the uh, hectare, roughly about uh, 7 to 10 tons uh, to the uh, acre. So this is the competition that's uh, coming down the line, and uh, this is their uh, old system, which would be uh, similar to our uh, you know, sprawling systems, but it's an uh, overhead system that's uh, roughly uh, bringing in about like uh, 18 tons to the acre, and uh, they're not seeing uh, much future for this, for uh, you know, export uh, potential later on. But this is uh, what's going to be, uh, you know, that this is what we're going to see uh, more and more taking uh, shelf space. So we need to be uh, uh, competitive in the uh, international marketplace. So we have this uh, evolution towards uh, spatio-temporal uh, management in our vineyards. So currently, uh, we have a uniform vineyard and our soil management, which would involve bulk or composite uh, vine and our soil sampling. 
So as we increase resolution for our measurement and our treatment, because we have a more planting uh, density, we are doing zone vineyard and soil management, which does involve a stratified random sampling of within a zone that you would uh, identify through a proximal sensing or a, you know, stratified uh, sampling uh, within these vineyards. So a future approach, as if, you know, if we can uh, dial this down, we're looking at a more site-specific uh, vineyard and soil management, which would involve a uh, fine grid sampling or uh, more sensing and uh, scanning. And I guess there are a lot of uh, outfits that are uh, providing these services, albeit uh, without any uh, ground truthing. So when Craig asked me to talk, I was like, well, what do you want me to uh, focus on? Because uh, mechanization is uh, you know, whole season long. He's like, well, uh, harvesting is uh, pretty much uh, taken care of, so he said, uh, you know, look at, uh, you know, canopy to uh, crop load management uh, using these uh, practices, because these are the ones that are costing the uh, most. So most of the time, uh, we manipulate the uh, shoot system of the grapevine, which is composed of the uh, stems, leaves, and the clusters, and collectively, uh, this makes up the uh, microclimate uh, within the uh, fruit zone, as you all know. And this microclimate is uh, affected which is just this uh, area around the uh, clusters by the amount of our uh, leaf area, distribution of this leaf area, and the uh, interaction with the uh, above ground uh, climate. So why worry about uh, you know, dealing with these things? So from this uh, classical uh, paper uh, from the uh, early 1990s, we are trying to uh, you know, make a harvesting decision to uh, have an uh, effect on uh, wine quality. But before you have the uh, harvesting decision, you have the uh, intermediate uh, end product, which is the uh, grape berry composition. So the grape berry composition will be uh, you know, affected by uh, some things uh, that we cannot necessarily control, such as uh, where the vineyard is located, what the uh, mesoclimate uh, of this uh, site is, such as temperature, wind, rain, exposure, relative humidity. But more importantly, the genotype and the competition uh, from uh, other species uh, will have an uh, effect on the uh, uh, parameters that we ultimately try to control. What we can uh, you know, manipulate very painstakingly is the uh, microclimate, which is the uh, bunch and the uh, leaf exposure and the uh, temperature uh, around the clusters, which would have an effect on the uh, vine growth and our uh, crop load which will ultimately drive our photosynthesis and our rate of maturation, which would have an uh, effect on the uh, composition of the uh, berries, which would uh, drive the uh, harvesting decision. So if I were to define our fruit maturity, I would say it is the uh, point at which fruit composition most closely matches that required to make the uh, style of wine uh, desired. It's a mouthful. These are the vineyards uh, that we uh, deal with most of the time. This is 70% uh, of the uh, California crush. These rows are uh, two miles long, and this is a Pinot Gris uh, vineyard in uh, Arvin, California. You know, nice cool climate, I guess, to make the uh, food composition that we would uh, desire, but this is the uh, reality of the uh, situation. So the uh, goal then is to uh, you know, make something uh, marketable from these uh, vineyards that you can uh, you know, do over and over and over after many years because you know, once you uh, uh, plant these vineyards, they're going to be in the ground for uh, 25 to uh, 27 years, which is the normal life cycle of a vineyard in California these days. So we have some uh, desirable uh, aspects. We're looking for a uniformly ripe fruit that is sound with an abundance of flavor with correct composition. It would have to reach peak at an ideal time, avoiding inclement weather, which most of California enjoys. We do not have that much inclement weather. And also uh, winery uh, logistics. A lot of this uh, fruit is uh, transported uh, four to six hours uh, before it gets to the uh, sugar stand. So this winery uh, logistics is uh, key to uh, maintain the uh, peak of our uh, fruit composition. But these are all fine and dandy, but in the end, uh, you know, yield is uh, what pays the bills and uh, yield is uh, paramount. So we are looking to, uh, you know, generate this uh, environment by uh, manipulating the uh, exposed uh, leaf area in these uh, vineyards. So sometimes uh, as an uh, extension spe specialist, uh, you'll get a phone call. It's like, well, you know, we're trying to grow Syrah, but uh, you know, uh, it's not uh, quite uh, working out. What should we do? And uh, by the time uh, you, know, you do a site visit like this, it's uh, Verizon, and it's usually uh, too late. So you are to looking to optimize diffuse or uh, indirect sunlight uh, with the uh, canopy interior 
and minimize exposure of clusters to direct sunlight, particularly in our warm climates. And I guess uh, these days, uh, we do not have that much uh, cool climate uh, left in uh, California, even in uh, uh, Napa and uh, Oakville area. We are looking at our shade cloths to, uh, you know, get rid of uh, some of this uh, overexposure problems we have with the uh, warming of the climate. So what can we do uh, in vineyards mechanically? Well, I have uh, put an uh, asterisk uh, in some of the things that we can do that we can uh, measure a physiological benefit. But if we look at the uh, three main commodities, wine, raisin, table grapes, harvesting about 90% of the acres in California that are under uh, wine grape uh, cultivation is mechanically harvested, raisins about 35%. When you look at uh, pruning, there are two types of pruning, pre-pruning or uh, box hedging. About 65% of our uh, acreage is uh, pre-pruned by some sort of uh, machinery. In raisins, about uh, 5%. In uh, table grapes, about 30% is uh, looking to be uh, pre-pruned by a uh, machine. Box hedging, uh, we're seeing uh, more and more of this in uh, California. About 12% of the uh, acreage is uh, box pruned, which is a final pruning. And as far as uh, canopy management goes, we're seeing about 45% uh, of our uh, acreage getting uh, mechanically uh, leaf removed. Shoot thinning, roughly about 7% uh, seven, uh, seven percent of the total acreage. This is mostly uh, going to be in the uh, coastal uh, areas. Hedging, this is uh, all done by machine by uh, cane cutters in uh, essentially all the vineyards. And shoot positioning, we have a few vineyards or a few uh, coastal areas, about 2% of the acreage that does this uh, mechanically. And cluster removal, this is about, uh, again, uh, similar to a uh, shoot thinning, about 7% uh, of the acreage. And this is now uh, usually done by uh, harvesters at a uh, greenberry drop. So dormant pruning is done uh, very regularly. And uh, you can do a final pruning with the uh, new machines uh, that they have uh, available. So it depends on uh, where you are. It's the dormant uh, season uh, practice. And uh, incidence of rain uh, can be uh, an uh, impediment to uh, you know, put uh, equipment in the vineyard. But most of the time, uh, this is a very uh, fast process. The dormant pruning uh, will define the uh, bearing surface where the uh, fruit will be born, and uh, it will uh, define the capacity of uh, production uh, for these uh, plants. So we have some costs uh, from a 2012 uh, study uh, that we did with uh, Cabernet. Spur pruning back then uh, was costing about uh, 29 cents a vine. Cane pruning, long pruning with tying, was costing about uh, 48 cents a vine. Mechanical pre-pruning with a hand follow-up was roughly about uh, 36 cents a vine. Box pruning a single high wire was uh, costing us about uh, 7 cents a vine. So there are some uh, economies of uh, scale that you can uh, achieve uh, you know, as you're uh, switching over to these uh, practices. We have types of equipment that are uh, available. And uh, you know, majority of these uh, equipment Manufacturers were from uh, Europe, but uh, you know a lot of uh, uh, manufacturing is now uh, happening in the uh, United States, specific to our uh, you know production uh, practices. We have various manufacturers, various materials of uh, construction. These may only do uh, one plane of cut, such as uh, you know uh, top them off. These were uh, mostly adapted to a uh, VSP type of uh, canopies, which we do not see. Uh, anymore uh, being planted in California. And uh, these usually have to be uh, followed up with uh, manual operations. The combination pruners, the modern pruners, have uh, multiple planes of cut. They may be used for uh, pre-pruning as well as uh, finish and uh, precision uh, pruning. They may be uh, used in uh, many types of canopies, including uh, split canopies and uh, uh, sprawling type of uh, canopies that you might see in the uh, San Joaquin uh, Valley. So, if you can uh, imagine this uh, percent of uh, nodes removed uh, during pruning as a continuum of uh, you know, amount of uh, buds you want to uh, remove, you can do a severe pruning, which is attempting to simulate a uh, hand pruning, and then uh, you will decrease the uh, pruning severity to a light pruning, or uh, you know, a mechanical uh, you know, hedging cut under the vines. But as you uh, reduce the, uh, 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 as you uh, decrease the uh, pruning severity, you also have an uh, increased need for a uh, crop adjustment during the uh, growing season. This crop adjustment might be, uh, you know, uh, some removal of, uh, you know, exposed leaf area, pre-bloom, or some, uh, you know, shoot removal, 
or some sort of a cluster drop uh, later on in the season. But also you have uh, increasing disease pressure from uh, the uh, old parts of the vine as you uh, retain our uh, longer uh, nodes on these uh, 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 pruning uh, practices. So mechanical uh, pruners, you know, they make them uh, so that uh, you, know, you can adapt them to uh, you know, whatever uh, type of uh, trellis uh, that you might have. So you have to define a spur height, how tall uh, you want to leave the uh, spurs to define the uh, bearing surface. Commonly, we retain about a four inch uh, hedge, about a hundred millimeter uh, hedge above the uh, cord on wire, which we would uh, call a precision prune. Pre-pruning uh, practices uh, can vary between uh, six inches up to uh, eight inches. These have to be uh, followed, up, followed up by uh, you know, either uh, hand operations or a second uh, cut, which would uh, increase the uh, cost of uh, production. And you have to define a bearing surface uh, girth, or uh, like the uh, width and depth of this uh, bearing surface. Commonly in sprawling canopies, the uh, width is uh, completely removed with uh, no hangers under the uh, cordon. Usually uh, we retain a box of about uh, four inches by uh, four inches, but uh, depending on, uh, you know, as raisins are uh, getting into this uh, uh, mechanical uh, pruning thing, we can, uh, you know, retain it up to uh, six inches uh, in our uh, raisins because they're just looking to uh, push more uh, green production. Usually uh, we can uh, go up to uh, one to uh, one and a half miles uh, per hour, but uh, if you remove the uh, tees or the uh, extraneous uh, catch wires uh, from these uh, simplistic uh, canopies, you can go about uh, two miles to the uh, hour uh, down these uh, rows in flat land. But again, uh, you know, uh, calibrating these things uh, require, uh, requires uh, measurement and uh, often, uh, you know, repeated measurements to make sure that uh, you're uh, dialed in. So here are the uh, parts of a mechanical pruner. This is a sprawling type of uh, pruner. So you have uh, two sets of uh, rotary uh, cutters that would uh, set the uh, bearing surface, uh, surface uh, height that would uh, define the capacity. You have these uh, sickle bar cutters. There's one, two, three, four, two more sets of these to get rid of the sprawl and uh, set the uh, girth uh, of the uh, bearing surface. So again, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, you have to uh, measure the uh, distance that you want to uh, keep as far as the uh, width of these canopies. And then uh, these uh, sickle bars and the uh, rotary cutters have to be uh, adjusted. So a lot of the uh, other uh, pruners that we used to work with have saws. And uh, here uh, you're seeing these are uh, rotary cutters. We went to this uh, kind of uh, design uh, because these do not need a uh, sharpening or replacement. So working with saws and the uh, palanques, et cetera, we've seen that uh, you know, we would uh, replace these essentially about uh, every uh, two rows or so. When rows are about a half a mile long, about 0.75 uh, acre uh, rows, every uh, one and a half uh, acres, you don't want to replace uh, saws because that is a cost. So here's the uh, rotary cutter. These uh, turn uh, you know, against each other in uh, uh, opposing directions, and uh, they do make uh, very fine cuts without like, uh, splitting the ends of the uh, shoots. And uh, here are the uh, sickle bar cutters. The distance uh, of these, how much uh, overlap, overlap they have uh, has to be uh, you know, uh, adjusted as well. And then uh, here's the uh, uh, sprawl cutters in the uh, bottom. And then uh, you have this uh, ski rack uh, here kind of thing that would uh, you know, guide you uh, into the row. And then there's an uh, electronic shoe uh, that if you hit a you know, stake, it would uh, open up the uh, pruning head and close it if you have uh, T's on the uh, uh, trellis. So here it is an uh, operation. In this case, uh, we were doing a pre-pruning pass in this uh, T-type of uh, canopy for an experiment. You can see that uh, you know, uh, this is uh, you know, set up uh, quite high to, uh, for a pre-pruning uh, operation. And then uh, it works uh, fairly well. We've done these studies for the last uh, 10 years. We cannot see any uh, you know, a distinction between uh, hand-pruned vines and uh, mechanically uh, box-pruned uh, vines as far as uh, you know, berry composition is concerned. So there's a lot of discussion about uh, doing uh, shoot thinning mechanically in uh, coastal vineyards. And uh, in our experience, uh, when we did the uh, berry composition and uh, uh, wine composition work, we have seen uh, you know, actual uh, measurable uh, benefits. So shoot thinning starts at uh, dormant pruning, as you well know, because pruning is shoot thinning. But you can also do a uh, trunk suckering with these uh, shoot thinning uh, machines. When the uh, shoots are about uh, one to three inches in uh, length, you can uh, sucker them uh, down the uh, uh, trunk. 
On the cordon, we have seen the uh, most benefit of a uh, mechanical uh, shoot thinning when the shoots are about uh, 8 to 12 inches long. What it does is uh, it reduces the uh, shoot density, but the impact on a uh, canopy uh, is often temporary if irrigation uh, is not uh, controlled. It is an efficient method of uh, crop thinning. It assists in the establishment of uh, spur positions in the following year, and uh, it does also uh, reduce pruning costs for the next season. We're seeing uh, costs uh, go down from about uh, $350 an acre if you were to do it by hand to down to about uh, $83 an acre in last year's dollars uh, if you were to do this by machine. So application, manual versus uh, mechanical. Well, manual's uh, quite easy. You remove the uh, rabbit's ears or the uh, shoots uh, that you do not want. Mechanical is this uh, funny looking machine. It's essentially a barrel with uh, silicone fingers that gets rid of the uh, undergrowth uh, on the canopy. The uh, actual uh, mechanism is uh, in the uh, front that would uh, hit the uh, cordon at a known uh, speed and distance to uh, thin the shoots. And uh, here's a Syrah canopy that likes to uh, flop, that people say it's uh, very difficult to mechanize. Well, uh, it does work uh, very well in uh, Syrah and uh, Merlot to open up these uh, canopies that people say it's uh, very difficult to uh, mechanize. So how would you set up these uh, mechanical shoot thinners, keeping in mind that the uh, front uh, implement here, these two silicone fingers, is uh, what sets the uh, shoot density. The barrel uh, here is the cordon brush that gets rid of the uh, hangers on the underside of the uh, cordon. You need to consider a target shoot density, be able to differentiate between uh, count shoots and non-count shoots. You have the cordon brush in the back and these uh, rotary paddles uh, in the front. So you can put up to uh, 12 rotary paddles uh, in this implement, and usually uh, 1 to 1.2 miles an hour is uh, what it takes. So for a 0.75 uh, acre row, you're done in uh, 45 minutes with the uh, shoot thinning operations. But again, these things have to be uh, calibrated, and you need to know the uh, shoot density uh, before you start. Another uh, problem variety, they say, is uh, Pinot Gris to uh, mechanize. Well, I think I did quite a bit of work with uh, Pinot Gris. So uh, here's a Pinot Gris uh, canopy that's being measured for uh, shoot density in the absence of uh, proximal sensing uh, to uh, assess the uh, you know, density uh, initially. Then the uh, pruning heads are uh, set, so this is set to uh, retain uh, 11 shoots per uh, fo uh, meter of row. I'm sorry, 11 shoots uh, per uh, foot of row. Uh, and then uh, you line up. And it works uh, fairly well opening up these uh, canopies. And then uh, I like showing this uh, picture a lot. The guy in the picture is uh, Dave Terry. He's here. This was from his uh, master's work. And I say this is the uh, most romantic uh, vineyard in uh, Chowchilla. Not because uh, you know, it looks uh, pretty, but you can see how the, uh, light, the dappled light is uh, filtering through these uh, uh, Syrah canopies on a California sprawl, which might be uh, difficult to achieve uh, given uh, how we uh, manage uh, vineyards in the uh, Central Valley. So these are the uh, yield averages with a uh, Syrah. So in this case, uh, it was compared to a hand pruned uh, canopy. These were uh, the rest of the treatments were uh, mechanically uh, box pruned. And then they were uh, shoot thin to uh, five shoes per foot of row, seven shoes per foot of row, or they were left uh, unthinned, which ended up being about uh, 15 shoes per foot of row. As you can see, uh, you know, berry weight uh, varies. As you retain uh, more shoots, you're going to have the uh, smallest berries, the smallest clusters. But uh, yields in tons per uh, acre, these are averages, 2009 to uh, 2011, uh, three-year three uh, averages. You see that uh, you know the uh, yields uh, settle at a you know nice uh, you know median for this uh, area, roughly about uh, 12 tons to the uh, acre. But our business is uh, you know perennial. We need to be able to make the uh, same plant uh, year after year. And I mentioned that uh, these uh, shoot thinning uh, operations have to be uh, you know combined with an uh, irrigation deficit. In this case, uh, we had an, uh, a sustained deficit where we applied 75% uh, of our ET crop the uh, whole season, or we applied a regulated deficit in uh, early season or uh, late season. And uh, 
the y-axis uh, pruning weight in kilograms per uh, meter of rho. So in California, we're trying to uh, stay between uh, 1 to uh, 0.8 uh, kilograms of uh, pruning weight per meter of rho, which is roughly about uh, 0.6 to uh, 0.7 uh, pounds per uh, foot of rho. If you look at this uh, crop load mid, which is the uh, seven shoots per uh, foot of row uh, treatment, it's uh, settling uh, very nicely at the uh, optimum uh, pruning weight. So this is one year, and this is the uh, second year. It's not the same figure. So what I'm trying to uh, tell you is that uh, you know, if you can uh, you know, uh, dial these in, and uh, we have published uh, enough of these uh, papers that you should be able to, you can make the uh, same plant year after year and uh, keep it uh, you know, sustainable for uh, many, many uh, years with uh, you know, uh, higher production. Of course, uh, you know, everyone's uh, favorite is uh, these uh, flavor uh, indicators. Uh, in a former life, I was uh, trained as a secondary metabolite uh, person, so I put it to use when I got a faculty job. So we looked at uh, methoxypyrazines and uh, uh, beta damascenone, which are uh, two indicators of uh, you know, whether it's going to go into a $5 bottle, super economy, or a $7 to $11 bottle, or a $11 plus, or a $20 plus. Methoxypyrazines are uh, generally uh, undesirable in uh, red grapes. Our uh, hand pruned vines had the uh, highest amount of uh, methoxypyrazines. Our box pruned vines essentially had uh, very little. When we look at the uh, beta damascenone, the jammy, uh, fruity uh, flavor uh, from the uh, same uh, vines, we're seeing that uh, hand pruned uh, vines also have a lot of uh, beta damascenone. However, the amount of uh, beta damascenone is not as uh, odor active as uh, methoxypyrazine, so it was not uh, able to uh, overcome the uh, methoxypyrazines that we were getting. So we alluded this fact to the, uh, in the uh, hand pruned vines. As you uh, prune them, you're leaving a lot of uh, gaps on these cordons, which populate uh, very rapidly uh, due to vegetative comp compensation, and these uh, canopies uh, shade themselves out very quickly uh, in the California sun. So not only are we able to uh, maintain the uh, you know, uh, highest uh, production with uh, the seven shoes per foot of row, we do not have any uh, green flavors. We do have a you know, manageable amount of uh, fruity, jammy flavors that can be either uh, made as a single varietal or it can be uh, blended in to uh, whatever uh, uh, product line uh, you're going into. Now, everyone's uh, favorite. This was uh, from a study where we looked at uh, Pinot Gris uh, management cost in uh, 2010 to uh, 2011. And in this case, uh, you know, we threw the uh, kitchen sink at the study. I had a very good uh, mentor uh, in a series uh, California. He runs a small uh, family-run uh, winery. And uh, one of their uh, largest operations is in uh, Pinot Gris. So they wanted to see what the uh, Pinot Gris cost uh, would be. So we looked at uh, hand pruning. Uh, low shoot density, medium shoot density, high shoot density. Uh, and then uh, we compared these to uh, mechanically, uh, managed, me mechanically uh, managed practices and added uh, leaf removal to these uh, practices. So all in all, uh, we looked at uh, 12 different uh, treatment combinations. Well, I guess you don't need a PhD to see uh, you know, uh, what the net income uh, per hectare or uh, acre is. There are only uh, one, two, three uh, production uh, methods that was going to uh, bring a positive uh, outcome. And the most uh, successful uh, one from the uh, money point of view is about, uh, is this one, which is uh, mechanically uh, pruning them with a high shoot density, or mechanically uh, pruning them with high shoot density and uh, adding leaf removal. But in the end, uh, we end up uh, recommending uh, this one because we are the uh, university, and uh, this one had the uh, most balanced uh, vines to go uh, year after uh, year. But you know, under our uh, correct uh, irrigation uh, situations, mechanically box pruning them and uh, irrigating them uh, correctly can be a sustainable option as well. So right now, uh, the uh, newest uh, frontier is uh, variable rate uh, mechanical uh, shoot removal. In this case, uh, you know, we would uh, look at these uh, vineyards using uh, proximal sensing, generate uh, vigor zones, and then uh, program these uh, machines to uh, take out uh, shoots in these uh, variable, uh, at a variable rate, because not every vine uh, needs the uh, same amount of uh, shoot removal. So this is still in the uh, experimental uh, stage, and then uh, at the uh, wine grape uh, short course in uh, December 12th and 13th, uh, we'll 
talk about uh, deploying this in uh, California in this uh, next coming season in the uh, Lodi region. Now, berry cluster thinning, two schools of thought, pre-bloom, post-fruit set thinning. We see the uh, most beneficial responses, when I say most beneficial response, earlier, earlier uh, harvest, when the berries are about uh, BB size. post on uh, applications, in our case, both in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, Tokolon, uh, Sonoma, have, have been uh, mostly uh, self-gratifying to the uh, winemakers, not, for, not to the uh, grape grower. Manual cluster thinning uh, looks like this. A lot of the uh, wine grape growers uh, you know, like seeing this. However, uh, this is not a you know, very good uh, method to make uh, money when you have uh, these uh, clusters uh, not touching each other. So variable uh, mechanical cluster thinning. Uh, we have uh, adapted this uh, blueberry picker from uh, Oxbow. This is a force balance uh, striker. What we now do is uh, we detect uh, berries using uh, camera images and then uh, generate these uh, heat zones. And these uh, heat zones are uh, programmed into this uh, machine. As it approaches this uh, canopy, it starts uh, violently uh, shaking the canopy, so it'll uh, pop the uh, berries off. It's not necessarily a cluster uh, thinning. But as I said, the effect of cluster numbers or berry numbers are uh, not really uh, you know, showing any physiological benefit other than uh, you know, uh, bringing in the uh, harvest uh, earlier. We do not see uh, any benefits in our uh, anthocyanin amounts, uh, proanthocyanin amounts, or uh, any uh, mouthfeel uh, amounts. Now, leaf removal, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more of it being done uh, mechanically because it's a repetitive task. Severity, it can be done on uh, both sides of the canopy, but most of the time, we do it on the shade side of the canopy. Cost is uh, $80 to uh, $250 an acre, depending on the uh, trellis type, hand versus machine, timing, and uh, canopy uh, density. We have uh, essentially one, two, three types of uh, equipment available. The first initial uh, equipment that came out was the uh, suck and cut type of uh, leaf removal uh, implements. These were mostly adapted to uh, VSP trellises since they uh, operated on the uh, uh, idea of like vacuum, they would uh, suck the flower clusters and later on the uh, infrutescence into the uh, chamber and uh, you know, it would uh, also uh, damage the crop. It did not work well in the uh, sprawling canopies. We also have uh, air blast type of uh, leaf removal implements. Again, these are mostly adapted to uh, VSP trellises and you also need a uh, you know, giant tractor to uh, operate these, roughly about an uh, 80 horse tractor but they have little to uh, no damage to uh, flower clusters. Rollover type of uh, leaf removal uh, implements, these are adapted to uh, VSP, sprawling and uh, split canopy systems. They are selective, they just uh, remove the uh, leaves and I'll uh, just uh, leave the petiole on there. And uh, we have seen uh, little to no damage to our uh, flower clusters and the clusters uh, later on in the season. Leaf removal, here's a rollover type of machine. Uh, they go through the canopy, and uh, you can uh, set the uh, baffle here to see uh, how much, uh, you know, how much uh, of a window you want to open. In this case, uh, we were opening up an 18-inch uh, uh, window, and uh, it works uh, repetitively uh, throughout the uh, you know, vineyard without getting tired. So pre-bloom versus uh, fruit set, why should I even uh, care? There's a lot of uh, discussion a lot of the uh, previous work uh, that uh, people were uh, looking at was uh, coming from uh, you know, uh, uh, northern uh, Italy where uh, sunlight is at a premium. But when we uh, have done these studies uh, repeatedly in uh, California, both in San Joaquin Valley and uh, Napa County, we do not see any uh, differences in the uh, amount of uh, berries set per cluster, whether you do it uh, pre-bloom or uh, post-fruit post-fruit set and uh, leaf removal in uh, California, we have not seen a decline in our uh, yields. What we have seen is a change in the amount of uh, skin mass where the flavonoids would be kept. If I do the post-fruit set, I have uh, less skin mass because it's uh, going to be exposed to a damaging UV light much later on in the season as opposed to pre-bloom, which has the amount, same amount of uh, skin mass as the uh, control where you would uh, be able to uh, store enough uh, flavonoids. So here's some economic data on uh, mechanical uh, leaf removal. Uh, a lot of people uh, cried uh, when this uh, study was being done because it was a massive uh, work. 
What we looked at was a, a pre-bloom leaf removal, post-fruit set, and compared with a, a, a sustained deficit irrigation and regulated deficit irrigation. So most of our practices, this is with uh, Merlot, uh, just a little bit uh, south of uh, uh, District uh, 13 in uh, Lodi. So when we uh, prune these grapevines, you know, we have a pruning cost, right? Everything is uh, pruned the same. If you do not remove uh, leaves, you have no cost of uh, removing leaves. But if you, uh, you know, add a leaf removal, this is going to cost you about uh, $30 in a hectare or uh, you know, roughly uh, half that uh, if you were uh, doing it uh, 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 in uh, acres. The amount of uh, irrigation applied is uh, going to change whether you use a sustained deficit or a regulated deficit. But I wanna point this out to you. So we're in the business of uh, farming for uh, phenolics. We can grow uh, sugar, no problem. We can grow uh, leaves, uh, no problem. But uh, in the end, uh, this thing is uh, crushed and uh, made into wine. It has to be a marketable product. So what the uh, growers uh, in this area were mostly interested in was the amount of uh, total uh, anthocyanin that they were uh, you know, getting per acre. So I can do nothing and uh, irrigate at about 70% uh, you know, of uh, crop evapotranspiration I'm going to get about uh, you know, two pounds of uh, anthocyanins uh, per acre. I can just uh, change uh, one practice, just do a pre-bloom uh, leaf removal, and I'm going to uh, double this uh, amount of uh, anthocyanins I uh, produce uh, per uh, acre. So when I look at the cost to uh, grow one unit of uh, anthocyanin uh, in a District uh, 13 uh, vineyard, if I do nothing uh, to grow a uh, you know, the same amount of uh, crop, it's going to cost me $1.56 to grow uh, one unit of uh, anthocyanin. But if I do a pre-bloom, uh, I see an uh, increase in the uh, catechin and epicatechin uh, monomers, which will, uh, you know, condense to uh, make tannins later on, and I see a lot of uh, total skin uh, uh, anthocyanins if I just do a pre-bloom uh, leaf removal. With post fruits that are leaf removal, uh, we have, although we have seen a decrease in our bare skin mass, we have seen an uh, increase in our total skin flavonols, but also an uh, increase in our tan and our content and our composition. Uh, since this is a, you know, a warm climate uh, uh, region, we want to uh, maintain uh, some sort of uh, astringency, which would be uh, measured by the uh, mean degree of uh, polymerization and our total skin uh, PAs. So in the case uh, where you want to uh, you know, have uh, both a uh, greater amount of uh, flavonols and uh, tannins, it would be a good idea to uh, consider uh, post fruits that are uh, leaf removal in this uh, warm region. I have the uh, water deficits uh, here. Uh, there are small deficits. We are really not ever uh, in like uh, deficit situations in California. Sustained deficit, you know, it'll uh, influence uh, berry mass, but a uh, regulated deficit has a tremendous uh, impact on our uh, yield. I mean, time and time over, both when we do this work in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, Central Coast, or uh, uh, in uh, Napa, we see a decline of our uh, yield, roughly about uh, 25%, and uh, this usually uh, does not pencil out because our uh, water is uh, still relatively uh, cheap, and uh, we do not get uh, that much of a benefit from our regulated deficit our irrigation uh, and the amount of uh, anthocyanins uh, that we uh, achieve with this uh, method. So this variable rate uh, thing is uh, coming on to uh, leaf removal uh, as well. So this is a vineyard in uh, Lodi. Well, actually, this is in uh, Galt. When the grower uh, bought this uh, property, they uh, bought it from another uh, grower, and uh, they were seeing these uh, irregularities in this uh, vineyard, so, which is indicated by this, uh, you know, uh, red space, and then uh, this uh, red region uh, you know, uh, occurs uh, regularly. So it uh, turns out uh, this uh, vineyard was uh, terraformed, and there's an underground uh, river uh, going through this uh, vineyard. But not every uh, vine had to be uh, you know, uh, leaf removed, so we were able to uh, program this uh, rollover uh, uh, leaf remover machine just to uh, you know, remove leaves uh, in this uh, area and these uh, you know, red spots in this vineyard. So a giant crew uh, did not have to come in for this 80-acre uh, block. So the path forward is if we can do these uh, practices at a variable rate. I mean, uh, there are various uh, equipment uh, uh, available to do these uh, practices at a uniform application. 
But the challenge now is to be able to uh, interpret this uh, data to apply it at a variable uh, rate, very much like in our uh, corn and our uh, soybeans, where they have seen uh, you know, yield, volume, and uh, quality of the uh, product that they deliver uh, essentially a uh, triple in the last uh, 20 years. So precision viticulture is a site-specific uh, management tool. This combines uh, new information and production experience to map variability of production and quality in order to optimize yield efficiency, berry composition, and uh, minimize the environmental uh, impact. So what this uh, involves is uh, essentially uh, information collection, viticulture appropriate mapping, decision support processing, and then uh, variable rate line management. And the cycle uh, keeps uh, continuing till differences in our vineyards uh, can be uh, coalesced. So we have a lot of these studies uh, across the uh, state of uh, California, and then uh, some of the larger uh, projects are uh, here in uh, Paso Robles by the uh, airport. So essentially, uh, like I said, this starts with uh, information collection, uh, both uh, proximal sensing, physiological measurements, and then uh, lab work. We use uh, high-resolution uh, digital elevation models, uh, canopy reflectance, electrical resistivity of the uh, soil, uh, multiplexer, which is a fluorescence uh, sensor, and then uh, combined with uh, satellite images. These things uh, you can buy from any uh, outfit. Now, they'll uh, deliver these to you. However, uh, a lot of the uh, information that you have will not be uh, ground truth. So what the university does is uh, you know, uh, combines these uh, sensing uh, measurements with uh, physiological measurements, most importantly for California, plant water status, canopy microclimate, and of course our uh, photosynthetic efficiency, and then I'll relate these to the uh, point soil measurements. In the laboratory, these will be assessed for uh, primary metabolism, and then a secondary metabolism for uh, flavanthriols, flavonols, anthocyanins, and uh, tannins, and then uh, we model these uh, using our uh, statistical packages to uh, push forward a model specific for, I uh, say, uh, North Coast, Central Coast, uh, San Joaquin Valley, and uh, also uh, table grapes. So the sensors uh, we have in use in California that we can get uh, you know, somewhat of a reliable uh, measurement out of are the uh, canopy reflectance sensors and the uh, soil sensors, which has been uh, available since the uh, late 90s. And the uh, soil sensor is this, uh, a great uh, Fresno State grad at uh, Gallo uh, devises a uh, sled where we uh, you know, slip the uh, soil sensor in. It's just uh, dragged through the vineyard. It automatically uh, regis registers the uh, magnetic uh, reflectance as it uh, you know, uh, interacts with the uh, water content in the soil. Canopy reflectance, uh, we use these uh, uh, proximal sensors that are uh, active sensors uh, similar to a green seeker but uh, they do not need to uh, just operate in daylight. We can uh, operate uh, at nighttime as well. And the newest thing uh, that we have is this uh, uh, stereo vision camera that can uh, image shoots, buds, flower clusters, et cetera, at about uh, 10 images a second, zips them together, and uh, gives you a predictive uh, yield or a shoot density or a pruning map. So all these things have to come together, but there's a lot of uh, processing. So this is an uh, experiment that is going into its uh, third year in uh, Sonoma. Uh, so this is a you know interesting uh, site. It's a hillside uh, vineyard where uh, you know the grower said like there's so much going on in this vineyard that uh, we don't know how to uh, tackle it. So we looked at it. So there's we uh, interpreted the uh, GPS data, generated the uh, terrain, generated the uh, slope. And what you can do with, uh, f this is freely available uh, data, you can uh, model uh, how the uh, water uh, flows through these uh, sites. So you can uh, model one millimeter of uh, water film uh, flowing down the site to uh, model where the uh, water catchments uh, would be. And essentially, uh, this is where the uh, frosting, uh, the areas that would be uh, frosted out uh, would be as well. Anyway, so, and then we looked at uh, grapevine uh, water status, so I'm going to uh, refer to a uh, higher water stress and a uh, lower water stress. So this is a uh, stem water potential, not leaf water potential, so just add a uh, point to uh, megapascals to these uh, values. So there's a clear trend uh, in this uh, vineyard that develops uh, over time, 
And then uh, the field uh, essentially uh, can be uh, divided into uh, two management zones, lower water stress and a higher water stress. Lower meaning uh, roughly around like a negative uh, eight bars, higher water stress being about a negative 14 bars, keeping in mind that the uh, vineyards are uh, you know, uniformly uh, irrigated, roughly about uh, eight gallons a week per vine. So there are two very different zones, two clusters. This explained about 70% uh, of the uh, variability uh, at the site. So when you uh, put all the uh, water potentials uh, over time, this is how the uh, field uh, lays out the uh, whole season. And the 3D model of the uh, water status uh, looks like this. And this is uh, what explained the uh, variability at the site. So this related uh, very well to the uh, surface uh, soil uh, electrical resistivity at about a foot depth. So that's where the uh, you know, variability at the site was uh, coming from. And then, uh, so we have a good relationships with our soil and our topography uh, at the site. So then we looked at uh, this, uh, again, uh, I've clustered these. So you have uh, two management zones in this uh, vineyard. And then uh, we started uh, digging into it uh, deeper from a uh, you know, primary metabolism uh, point of view. When we look at the uh, yield in this plant, there are, again, uh, essentially uh, two zones here, but the number of uh, clusters uh, per plant do not vary. Average uh, cluster weight uh, per plant uh, varies, very similar to the average yield per plant. So when we look at the uh, evolution of the uh, berry weight at the site uh, using uh, you know, a whole scale uh, interpolation, the berry weight was not uh, affected by uh, plant water status at the site because everything's uh, irrigated the same. So there's not a significant uh, relationship at this site between our water status and our yield. And I'm not the only one that's going to uh, tell you this. So Larry Williams is uh, probably going to tell you this uh, again and again and uh, you know, make fun of you sometimes. I don't know. So when you look at the uh, primary metabolism, the bricks is uh, separating by uh, water status. And then our bricks is uh, separating uh, very similar to the uh, water status. So does the uh, titratable acidity uh, time cluster. It's uh, separating uh, very similarly. When we look at the anthocyanins, lower water stress gave us uh, more anthocyanins than the uh, higher water stress. And it was uh, negatively uh, related to the uh, stem water uh, potential. And then uh, when I look at the uh, ratio of uh, tri to uh, dihydroxylated anthocyanins, this was uh, positively uh, related to uh, stem water potentials, and that's uh, what we knew from our uh, primary uh, research. And then uh, again, uh, the uh, relationship is the uh, same. Lower water uh, stress uh, gave us a better uh, distribution of uh, anthocyanins in the berry. Tannins uh, responded the uh, same as well, and uh, so did the uh, catechin uh, monomers. So in this case, uh, we devised a system to uh, selectively uh, harvest the system because you're not going to go over a 70-acre uh, site and uh, pick uh, everything by hand. So this map was uh, loaded on to a yield monitor on an Oxbow uh, harvester. Quality A, which was the uh, lower water status. Quality B, which is the uh, higher uh, water status. They were uh, put into uh, different gondolas by a simple uh, algorithm that was uh, programmed into the uh, Ag Insight uh, leader. So moving forward, we know that uh, vineyard variability affects uh, harvest composition. Selective harvest uh, in these large sites can be a good tool uh, when this uh, variability is uh, too large to coalesce. Water status in California allows to effectively uh, discriminate these things. Some other things can be done, like uh, running double lines in these uh, you know, higher water stress re uh, regions. However, uh, it has to pencil out uh, for the uh, grower to make that uh, investment, because you know, at the site, uh, it was not uh, affecting our uh, yield. But moving forward, we can achieve our economies of scale with our mechanical practices. Equipment is available to do most of the cultural practices. Precision and uh, accuracy uh, continues to improve. Spatiotemporal management will alleviate variability. It will not solve uh, all our problems. Berry composition concerns uh, remain, however. Resistance uh, in the last two years from the winemakers have uh, seemingly uh, diminished. Canopy size and our uh, crop estimation will more than likely be uh, done uh, with our proximal sensors in the next five years.